Hey everyone, Sleepy Reader here, Damien, here to share, toss out at you some comic book thoughts on some of the comic books I've read in the past few weeks. Um, a bit random stuff I could grab, <laughs> that I could find right at the moment. Like I wanted to talk about Damage, which I did finally find at the fourth comic book store I went to. But I don't have it with me and it kind of would be more fun to talk about if I was showing the art. So maybe I'll find that and throw together another comic book thoughts video soon. Although um, I kind of in my mind compared Damage to Thanos, which is the new arc of Thanos is by Donny Cates and is it Greg Shaw? Jeff Shaw. And they are the creative team behind God Country. And um, so you can see how a kind of cosmic Thanos type of story kind of goes, goes well with what they were doing in God Country. Um, really, this is a much less a much less layered story than what they did in God Country, but I'm still enjoying it quite a bit. Um, so kind of glad I've jumped on it, despite the uh, <clears throat> the expensive and flim flimsy Marvel comics. I don't want to jump on too many Marvel comics. It's got great coloring, great kind of scale. Jeff Shaw is really good at that scale. He, he showed that in um, God Country, and now he gets to do even more of it. Um, it's got a really fun character in the um, this future Ghost Rider who's kind of like a herald of Galactus, only he's a herald of elderly Thanos, I guess. Um, the reason why I kind of associate it with um, Damage, and Damage had that, that 90s big, everything is big, all the pages are big art, is this has a lot of big art too. Um, I think, so it's a lot of fun to look at. It's a very, even though it's about like the most evil dude ever, uh, it's, it's really a fun light read, nothing to take too seriously. I think in a way, you know, Thanos has been done to death. <laughs> he, he's a, probably a hard character for a writer to think of what to do with him in an ongoing series. And this is a fun enough solution. I, I love this scene. This is just before Thanos destroys the Celestials. Now, I'd love to know how he really does it. Um, it seems simple enough. I guess he just, by killing Black Bolt, Bla I'm assuming, it's never explained unless this happened in some other comic before, Black Bolt's death blast destroys all the Celestials. Um, probably couldn't really, doesn't really make sense. But anyway, um, great widescreen, fun, silly comic book. And that kind of thing I'll like if it has the right touch, and it has the right touch here. Um, so, yeah, it's probably not not worth the uh, the kind of money that they charge at Marvel for 20 pages on flimsy paper and flimsy covers. But if you're willing to pay that, um, it's a fun read. And um, it reminds me a little bit of Jason Aaron's Thor run before the She-Thor when they had the old Thor and the middle Thor, middle-aged Thor and the young Thor, um, we've got old Thanos and middle-aged Thanos so far. Maybe we'll get some other versions of Thanos as we go along. So while I'm talking about books that are mostly just for fun, there's Fujitsu, and I enjoyed the first two issues a lot, and then I read the second two issues um, all together, and issue f three is done as if it's an old comic with lots of those little dots of the color dots that would have been in comics but exaggerated a bit so um a bit more distracting than they would have really been in an old an old comic book um and it has some fun touches of it's it's like a reading a comic book about fujitsu's adventures in the um 60s or early 70s where he's a kind of a sidekick to a character that's kind of like Captain America, but is Johnny Unitas, the football player, who uses all his football moves as the, um, what do they call him? The golden arm. Um, it was a lot of fun. It's, um, 
the drawing to me, and I guess the excuse could be because it's like an old comic, but kind of sketchy. Um, old, those older comics actually had a nice inky weight to them, which this lacks. But then, <clears throat> so I, I was having fun until we get to this scene where the world's tallest man, the bad guy, um, is stabbing Fujitsu, and somehow Fujitsu survives being stabbed, but it's just so totally unclear. And then the fact that he somehow sent this world tallest man to the end of time or something, all of that is just, there isn't enough hand wavium, you might say, pretend science to explain these things, to make me buy into it. So suddenly I'm not buying into him being stabbed and not dying. I'm not into understanding in any way his ability to send the guy to the end of time. You know, if only he had just sent him to prison, if only there had been some, just some simple explanations of things. And then he comes at him with his kind of Transformers giant robot with Fujitsu inside of that now in the, in the present when the bad guys come back. Um, I don't know why I'm trying to describe this to you because I'm sure it seems very incoherent. I'm kind of working my way around. Then there's kind of this... I don't know. What I'm saying is it, it's become less satisfying, partially because of those things that weren't explained very well or just became so fuzzy without a real explanation. And then this giant fight scene um, really felt kind of meaningless to me um, in this next issue. Um, and then wh what happened? Suddenly we get a much older version of the world stalls man or like some time has passed somehow and his beard has grown. Um, the, so these kind of skips and jumps and discontinuity are, are building up and bothering me more. There's one more issue in this story, so I'll get that issue and then I will um, remove this from my pull. I don't even know if it's... They're kind of vague on whether it will continue after the, the fifth issue. Um, they may be waiting to see on sales. Um, it says to be concluded at the bottom here. Um, it's somewhere I, yeah. So I'm sort of seeing a pattern with a number of Aftershock comics that they start off strong and then they kind of lose a bit. And I feel like um, they need more editing, like the kind of editing where an editor talks over the plot with the um, writer and talks about plot holes and how you can shore it up and stuff like that the way old-fashioned editors used to do. Um, presumably Aftershock, unlike Image, is a comic, a, a comic book company that has editors, and that's why it's a bit different from Image. Um, I have mentioned before that Fujitsu is one of the few where the copyright is held by both the artist and the writer instead of just the writer. So anyway, I'm not upset that I've read, will end up reading five issues of Fujitsu, but I'm a bit disappointed. Uh, the promise... It, it's not as great as it's promised so far, unless something amazing happens in issue five and completely turns me around. Speaking of promise, I had way too high expectations for um, Snagglepuss, who is the um, pink lion back in Hanna-Barbera cartoons who had short little episodes where he would say, exit stage right and heavens to Murgatroyd. I can't do his voice. Um, and I thought that was a kind of a cute character to bend and twist in, you know, I'd heard it would be a gay playwright in, in Greenwich Village in the 1950s. And what we have is someone who is exactly Tennessee Williams, but Snagglepuss um, at the peak of his career um, as a big star playwright in New York City. Um, who's secretly leading a gay life. And again, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. No, that could be an interesting story. Um, but in the, um, in the working out, it, to me, it's, it's a far cry from, so far, from Flintstones. Um, when, when, uh, the, when this writer, Mark Russell, did the Flintstones, with uh, Steve Pugh, and it kind of had this free-flowing, loose, um, a loose take on the Flintstones, but also a loose take on human history and a kind of 
playful look at all the foibles and flaws of humans and human society and history, a kind of liberal, if you will, but whatever, a critique of civilization and but in a very informal, fun kind of spooling out, you kind of felt like the writer was discovering what he felt as he was writing about um, animals that are used as, um, as uh, <clears throat> household utilities and things like that. Whereas this feels like he got his idea and then he's just doing it by the numbers. The, the House on American uh, Committee and the gay playwright and the issues of communism and the what are they called the Rosenbergs is it the Rosenbergs the the famous trial of the people who um, gave away the atom bomb or may have given away the atom bomb secrets to the Russians. Um, so I don't know what I'm what I'm saying is it's very flat relative to what I had hoped for. Maybe it's actually good and I I can't see that. I don't think it's bad, but I can't see that it's great because of my expectations, or maybe it's not great. Some of the details that I found <clears throat> confounding, like where is he going with this? What's the purpose of this? Is in his play, the, the actors are human beings who are wearing little animal masks. But then um, in the rest of the world, uh, it's a mix of various animals and human beings. And, um, <clears throat> you know, even the people working in the back in the theater, some are humans, there's a hippo. Um, and then in his secret gay life, um, Snagglepuss goes off to a gay bar. Um, I say gay bar in quotes because I'm not sure if this really counts as a gay bar, um, where he meets his lover, a human man. So what we have is a um, pink lion making out with a human man. So that's just not, if you're wanting to make a statement about homosexuality in the 50s, what statement are you making when you're mixing species? Um, I don't know. It just seems, conf it feels like he's not going to address it. He's just going to be, oh, this is the weird cartoon land. But, but if, if the whole comic is being so serious about anti-communism and uh, um, homophobia and society at the time, you've got to, there's got to be meaning for these kinds of things too. Maybe, maybe I'm going to give this at least another issue, maybe three issues. It's a six-issue story. Because um, certainly with, uh, with Flintstones, I grew to like it more and more as it went along. I think it was around issue three or four that it really was like, God, I, I have to keep getting all these Flintstones books. So, but yeah, I, I, I think conceptually he felt... It's almost like he felt like he was doing something more important. I'm really going to do my important statement book. And it got too serious. And the fun is squeezed out of it. And the playfulness is squeezed out of it. And maybe the art is wrong for it too. Um, this anthropomorphic animals and stuff. They're just kind of, the way this artist draws them, they're just kind of unpleasant to look at, in my opinion. And the, the coloring has a lot of colors that are kind of, they're like fingernails against the chalkboard a bit. The, the com to me, the combination of cover colors here and scenes like this. So those are my thoughts about that. I'm not. I've heard people rave about what a great book it is, and I know I just I wanted. You know, you never really know what you want, but I wanted something that gave me the same fun and criticism of civilization or whatever, um, as the as the uh, Flintstones did, and I didn't get that mix of stuff there. By Commandy Challenge number 12, the final issue in this round robin storytelling where every issue ends on a cliffhanger and the next writer has to solve the problem, I had no expectations. So I kind of enjoyed it because I think it should have only, as I've said before, should have only been about six issues. Uh, this kind of round robin thing can't hold up for 12 issues. 
Um, and it never was that good. There were a few issues, maybe three total for me that I really w was kind of impressed by aspects of them. I liked seeing the um, Jill Thompson art here. Now that turned out to just be a dream. And then we went into the world of some pretty cool um, Ryan Sook art. So I'm not going to say no to that. And Gail Simone, the writer, did her best to kind of wrap things up. One thing I thought is throughout this series, other characters who befriend um, Commandy have to die. I'm not sure what that's saying. Um, a lot of a lot of his companions die. I feel like in the actual Commandy, maybe that happened once or twice, but here it's like a constant death of Commandy's com companions. Um, so, but and there was kind of some nice ideas in here about the rats and stuff, but it wasn't developed well. So when we got to the solution of the problem, it uh, with the giant, the giant pile of rats, it felt undeserved. Although it was kind of kind of a clever idea, um, and a clever idea when they did the cyclo heart on the giant conglomeration of rats. But again. It feels like the the writer pulled that out of her hat without earning it first in some way. Oh, I've got some people come home, so I think I'm going to stop here. I'll do another video soon. Oh, I did want to say also that it, so there was a second story at the end, a kind of epilogue, where Commandy got to rewrite reality with Jack Kirby's help, and I found that guys, kind of disappointing. Guys, Dad. Look who's arrived. It's Cracking Duck. With me. No, this one was about stuff that you wouldn't be interested in, but we can do another video. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Talk to you all later. Bye-bye.